Good morning. So glad that uh, you're here to worship with us on Palm Sunday and as we, as we celebrate our King. You can see the kids have some ribbons in lieu of palms this morning, which we'll be waving a little later as well. There is a lot coming up. I'll try to do this very quickly, but there is a lot uh, coming up on this very special week together in the life of our church. Um, we'll start with all the Easter announcements. The, um, so this Wednesday night, there will be choir practice, so everybody can prepare for the Easter service. So I encourage um, anyone who would like to come in, whether for the first time or you've been coming on a regular basis, uh, feel free to come on Wednesday and, and join the choir as well. Then Thursday night, so that's Wednesday night. Thursday night, we're having our Monday Thursday service here um, in, and just a, a quiet reflective service here on, on Thursday evening. And then the next morning, Good Friday, we will be having our joint Good Friday service with four other churches. Um, and it will be held at Bears Road Baptist Church. And then... Um, that's at 10.30 in the morning. At 2.30 in the afternoon, families are invited here. We're going to have an Easter family event uh, with some songs and games and crafts as we remember the real reason for that we're celebrating Easter. Then if, that, if, you're, not, if you're not too tired, the next morning... Uh, Saturday morning at West End, there will be a breakfast and the, uh, with Andre, who's the team lead uh, for CBM Africa, and he'll be uh, speaking. There is a sign-up sheet on in the foyer for that, but you may need a break because Sunday is coming, and uh, our, su our sunrise service will be six, at 6.45 a.m. It will be behind the Bedford Basin Market down there where we've had it the last few years. So if you kind of, if you're not sure where that is, if you go to the Irving there at the on Bedford Highway, um, just follow the cars and the noise. So we'd love to, uh, we'd love to have you there. And then a short break before you come here for Easter breakfast at 9.15. And there's also a sign-up sheet and James will come up in a moment too to talk about that. And at 9.15, and during that uh, breakfast, probably 9.30, quarter to 10, we will have an Easter egg hunt for the kids. And then we'll be back here, same time, same place next week for our Easter worship together. So I'm going to invite James to come on up to talk about the Easter breakfast briefly, and then I'm going to invite Michelle to come up and talk about the pulpit committee briefly. Yes, uh, the Easter breakfast is next week, 9.15. We really would like to have a good guess of how many people will be here. Uh, the sign-up sheet is right outside. I already uh, saw there are about 50 people come up, uh, sign up. So that is very good, but I still, if you intend to come, I really would appreciate you sign up because I don't want to see 50 sign up, 100 show up. Okay, that, that would not be good. So if you can uh, sign up, that's, that's nice. Uh, the second thing is I thank you very much for those who promised to help to set up. Um, the setup is next. Saturday, 1 p.m. at the gym. So we have the setup for those who already promised to help. Thank you very much. For those who still would like to uh, do some exercise and help to uh, move the tables and chairs and set up is next Saturday, 1 p.m. And uh, we'll set it up. And also, I need some people. I already contacted some. Thank you that you... For, for those who say yes, 
And after the church service next week, we'll probably will also need some muscles to um, help to put the chairs, table, and everything back. So, yes, contact me if you are uh, uh, willing to help to, to set up and clean up. Good morning. Um, I'm just here to give everyone an update on the public committee. Um, we have been meeting weekly since the end of January. Uh, the deadline for applications was March 15th. It, it has passed. We did receive several applications uh, for the lead pastor position. We have reviewed the uh, applications and currently we are moving forward in the next step in the process. Thank you very much. Great. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, let's uh, read these words from Matthew and then from Psalms. And I'll invite the worship team to come on up as I read. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. And Psalms, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal, festal procession up the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. So like our, those in the Old Testament and those... On Palm Sunday, let's stand and, and offer praise to God together.
Because if I do not give this to him. Except for hearts, see. 
I'm going to invite the kids to come on up. Bring your, bring your ribbons too that you got. Got a few people. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So we've already been talking about it is it is Palm Sunday, and we're going to be talking a lot about that downstairs too. But it's a time when people came and praised. Jesus. So what are some words you think they said when they were praising Jesus? Or that we could say? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's a good one. Hallelujah. They were saying Hosanna in the highest. Yeah. And they were saying, maybe they were saying, praise God, or I love you, God. I love you, Jesus. We don't know, know all the words, but we are going to, I'm going to get Greg to come up and we're going to, oh, he's already up. Good job. And um, we're going to go on, do our own little parade. We're going to we're gonna loop around. I was thinking of making you loop up here, but you know what? The, Jesus went through the streets with all the people, so we're going to go through the people too. We're just going to do a loop here, and while he's playing, and we're going to swing our ri ribbons like, like branches and praise God. Okay? Okay. So we'll just wait till we get some music going and we're going to go this way. You can follow me. Palm Sunday Parade. So we're going to talk a little, a whole, uh, not a little, a whole bunch more about that downstairs. But before we go downstairs, let's, uh, let's say a prayer together. Dear God, thank you that you came to earth so we could know you more. Thank you that you love us and for all you've done for us. And, and we, we praise you. And thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll take, we can uh, take the ribbons downstairs and we'll collect them downstairs. I've been thinking lately about repentance. Perhaps that's a natural thing to be thinking about as in the run-up to Good Friday, when we think about uh, the fact that Jesus took our sins on himself. We take some time for self-examination, for wondering about, about our own misdeeds, our own wrongs, the guilt that we feel. And um, I've often wondered along with that about how this works in the Christian life and and especially how it works in relation to faith. Uh, many times the Bible tells us, repent and believe. And uh, sometimes, I think, in our own experience, it's a, a heavy sense of guilt that leads us to look for a solution and discovers Jesus. And then we trust in him. But I think in the ongoing Christian life, it often works in the opposite direction that more often repentance follows belief. 
It's as we draw closer to Jesus, as we believe in him more, as we realize that that we need him more and more, as we do that, as we become more like Christ, then repentance becomes even fresher and, and more urgent in our lives, maybe. As we appreciate Jesus' perfection, our own imperfections are more striking. And so I thought that we might spend some time as we pray today praying prayers of repentance. And uh, as they more or less apply to you, please take them deeply into your hearts. And in the times of silence, briefly, please feel free to add your own in your own prayer as we go along, because, because all of our prayers need to be specific. We're all very different, and we all have specific sins to confess to. But we also have a, a great God and Savior, our Lord Jesus, who with enormous forgiveness washes over us and, and cleanses us from every sin. If we, are faith, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive, has already, and will continue to do that. So know that as, even as we pray into the depths of our sin, that we have a wonderful Savior. Jesus paid it all. Let's bow in prayer. God, our Father, we come to you today because Jesus, our Savior, said we should, showed us how. And we come to you today because the Holy Spirit has promised that he will pray with us, along with us, and intercede with us, uh, for us, rather, with sighs too deep for words. So, Father, thank you for your wonderful work of creation and for caring for all that you've made. Thank you for guiding history to accomplish your purposes. Thank you especially for sending Jesus and for calling people, including people like us, to trust you and serve you. Please, God, forgive us for defacing your creation, for resisting your loving care, We're sorry for all the times when we have rebelled against your plans. When we gave the Lord Jesus the cold shoulder. When we turned away from your invitations to serve. Thank you, Father, that your love is eternal, your mercy never failing, and your forgiveness complete. Jesus, we praise you for your glorious incarnation, for your birth at Christmas, for the wonderful fact that in you God came to us. Thank you, Jesus, for your inspiring teaching, your challenging stories, your revealing encounters. And thank you, Jesus, especially for your resolute determination to save the world, even when it meant suffering and death for you. So Lord Jesus, as we've walked with you this month toward the cross and been challenged by the high expectations you have for your disciples, we confess our failure over and over again, our failure to meet that challenge. We've been distracted by temptations and tortured by doubts. We've swerved away from the course that you set. And yet you've guided us back on the right way. You've given us wise companions on the discipleship journey and godly examples to inspire us. But all too often, we have rejected their wisdom, taken their friendship for granted, and turned to another way. Restore us again, Lord Jesus Christ. 
and renew our decision and our devotion to you this Holy Week and Easter. Holy Spirit of the living God, we worship you for all you have done, anointing the Old Testament heroes, inspiring the scriptures, coming on Pentecost to set fire to your church, and giving one gift after another to your people through the centuries. You've maintained your church through so many difficulties. And yet, God, we've grieved your Holy Spirit. We've paid much less attention to the scriptures than we ought to have. We've neglected the gifts that you've given us, hidden them away often, sometimes for years at a time. And yet, Spirit, you never leave us or forsake us. You keep on renewing our discipleship. You keep on strengthening our faith. You keep on turning us to repentance. God, don't let us ever lose that. And Holy Spirit of God, fill us once again so that we could with a, a, a live edge, with a, a, a wonderful expectancy and a, a, a glorious determination so that we could serve you, serve your church, reach out to the people around us who need to know the Savior Jesus. God, come and help us these days to bring ourselves before you, to repent, to turn to you afresh. And thank you for your wonderful, wonderful forgiveness. To you, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we give all the praise and all the glory today and forever. Amen. Ah, and God, we just have needs of our own here at church. We have people who need our prayers in particular, ones that we know who are suffering, who are dealing with approaching death, who suffer isolation. Many still have COVID. Come to each one, God, and, and be the support that they need. We pray for our friend Martin that you would help him as he uh, goes to knee surgery tomorrow. And we ask God that that would be very successful. We thank you for his service this morning and, and for so many mornings before. And we pray that you will return him mobile and in good spirits to us in due time. For all the other concerns, God, that are on our minds, we just offer them to you confidently in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our hymn is Jesus Paid It All. And if you're able, please stand with us.
seated, and uh, Kathy and Caleb are going to come and read scripture. Peace be with you. The scripture I will read for you today is Luke chapter 19, 1 to 10 verses, and 37 to 44 verses. I will read it in Cantonese, and Kathy will read it in English. Please listen carefully to the word of the Lord. Jesus went to Jericho. When he was there, there was a man named Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector. He 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 was a 因为耶稣必从那里经过，耶稣到了那里，抬头一看，对他说：撒该，快下来，今天我必住在你家里。他就急忙下来，欢欢喜喜的接待耶稣。众人看见，都私下议论说：他竟到罪人家里去住宿。撒该站着，对主说：主啊！我把所有的一半给穷人，我若敲诈了谁，就还他四倍。耶稣说：今天救恩到了这家，因为他也是亚伯拉罕的子孙。人子来，为要寻找拯救失丧的人。将近耶路撒冷，正下橄榄山的时候。众门徒因所看所见到的一切异能，都欢喜快乐，大声赞美神，说：奉主命来的王是应当称颂的。在天上有和平，在至高之处有荣光。众人中有几个法利赛人对耶稣说：夫子，责备你的门徒吧。耶稣说：我告诉你们，若是他们闭口不说，这些石头必要呼叫起来。耶稣快到耶路撒冷，看见城，就为他哀哭，说：巴不得你在这日子知道关系你平安的事，无奈这事现在是隐藏的，叫你的眼看不出来。因为日子将到，你的仇敌必捉起土里，周围环绕你，四面困住你。并要扫灭你和你里头的儿女，连一块石头也不留在石头上，因你不知道眷恋你的时候。Luke 19:1 to 10, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Luke 19, 37-44 when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in a loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke these disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, 
had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and your children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. May God bless his holy word. Well, good morning, everyone. One of my favorite podcasts is a podcast about the hidden world of design, about how the things that we often take for granted or see or move through in the course of a week um, have a lot of thought put into them and have a lot of design and order behind what we see that we often aren't aware of. And I like this podcast because it makes me aware of and appreciate things like postage stamps or flags or grocery stores. Grocery stores are laid out in really specific ways to entice us to shop in specific ways and spend our money in specific ways. And the kind of design that goes into something like a grocery store or a flag, surprisingly, perhaps, because we're too familiar with it at times, is also present in these gospel stories that we come to particularly the familiar ones like Zacchaeus. And I have to admit, as I turned the page in my Bible in the course of planning for this sermon, and I read chapter 19 about Palm Sunday, and it began with the story of Zacchaeus, I felt a thrill of excitement. It's a bit of an illicit thrill, actually. Could I preach on something that's not Palm Sunday on Palm Sunday? But Luke puts the story of Zacchaeus right at the beginning of this chapter, this final chapter of Jesus' long, hard, faithful journey to Jerusalem. And we've been on this road with him for about three weeks now. You'll remember as you cast your mind back, as you look at the screen behind me, that we've been focusing on the cost of discipleship, these regular returning themes in Jesus' conversations on the road to Jerusalem about what it really costs to be his disciple. We began three weeks ago as the disciples faced rejection from those who did not welcome them and their master into their towns. And Jesus used that opportunity to correct their desire for revenge, but then also open up that conversation to talk about those distractions and things that seem reasonable and good in our eyes, but which often pull us from a full, complete, number one priority type of discipleship in him. The second week, we talked about striving urgently, about Jesus' reminder that the door to salvation is narrow, that it is easy to miss, that it is easy to assume that we can coast our way through, that we can be carried by others or accidentally find our way there at the right time. No, Jesus says, it takes striving and urgency, a focus and a dedication to following me where I will go. And last week, Pastor Leslie reminded us of Christ's teachings that he, if we are truly his disciples, he must have the priority, not our families, not our friends or our communities or our own lives. And he reminds us that we are to count the cost as we follow him on this road to Jerusalem. They've been a heavy few sermons. It's a heavy topic, the cost of discipleship, and understandably so. As Christ has these conversations, he is walking towards his death. They all happen in the shadow of the looming cross on that hill outside of Jerusalem. He walks towards a city that will ultimately reject him and crucify him. And now today, on Palm Sunday, we arrive at the city but not the city that we might be expecting. Before we arrive at Jerusalem, there's one last stop on this road trip, the city of Jericho. Now, who is familiar with the city of Jericho? Are there any Bible scholars among us? Fans of children's songs from Sunday school days? Who fought the battle of Jericho? This section, Joshua. 
Jericho was a walled city in those early stories. A city that stood as an obstacle to the Israelites as they entered into the promised land. A city that was arrogant in its refusal to allow them passage, confident in the strength of its walls and its military. It was a city that was ultimately destroyed as God's power was exercised against it as he shepherded his people into safety. And it was a city that was cursed. After its destruction, there was a curse placed on it to prevent someone from having the arrogance or the desire to rebuild it, to reestablish this bulwark. And yet, eventually it was rebuilt at great cost. And it became a wealthy and prosperous city, not far from Jerusalem. And it was home, we're told, to a man named Zacchaeus. And I'm wondering if there are any other biblical scholars or fans of children's music who could tell me anything about Zacchaeus. He was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. Well, don't spoil, don't spoil the story, Huina. We need to build it up. Zacchaeus was a man in Jericho. We're told a few things about him in this passage. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. He was a tax collector who oversaw other tax collectors, which is informative for us because we know as we read the Gospels that tax collectors were not popular figures. The tax collectors, just like in our day, as someone said in the back, but more so. Imagine, if you will, that the CRA in Winnipeg was not collecting money that we had agreed as citizens to provide and had a vote on in our elections, but it was taking our money and shipping it to our greatest military enemy, someone who had invaded our land, took our wealth and used it for themselves, and pushed us when we encountered them in the street with their swords and shields. Imagine if the money that was collected from us by these tax collectors was used to build things like crosses, to forge nails, to enslave and oppress our brothers and our sisters. And imagine if that money was collected not by strangers who'd arrived into our land, but by our neighbor, cousin, son, who decided that they could get rich by helping our enemies. Now imagine that one of those neighbors, cousins, or sons was so successful at betraying us that he was put in charge of all the other tax collectors in the area. And imagine if these tax collectors got paid not salaries out of our taxes that we agreed on, but by collecting more than they were supposed to. Imagine if these tax collectors got paid by listening to Rome and collecting what Rome wanted and then taking as much on top of that as they could. That's the kind of tax collector that Zacchaeus is when we meet him. And he is not only a chief tax collector, but he is a wealthy chief tax collector. He is good at taking more than he needs to. He's also short. He's a wee little man. And this poses some challenges. Because as we meet Zacchaeus, he wants something. He desires something. He's seeking something. Zacchaeus, wealthy, disliked, hate it, resent it, wants to be part of the action. Something is happening in his city. Jesus is arriving. And where Jesus goes, miracles happen. Teaching surprises and entices, challenges. Sometimes the proud are corrected and the humble are raised up. And Zacchaeus, wealthy tax collector, Short Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. We're not told why. But we can imagine. I understand from looking at lives that have been wealthy but disliked that both of those things come with a certain amount of isolation and loneliness. I also understand that looking in my life, when I desire wealth and have chased after it, it has never been satisfying. 
It has always left emptiness where I hoped it would fill. And so I wonder, as Zacchaeus comes to seek Jesus, if he's coming, both out of a sense of interest and excitement, he wants to see what's happening, but there has to be more, because as he faces the challenges that prevent him from seeing Jesus, he works and strives hard to overcome them. First off, he is a wealthy tax collector, and I imagine he would not be welcomed in the middle of the crowd as people recognized him. He's also short, and he can't be at the back of the crowd. So what do you do if you can't charm your way to the front, if you can't rely on goodwill and neighborly accommodation to move to where you can see? Well, maybe you go home, unless you need to see Jesus unless you're striving to see Jesus, unless you can't go home without seeing him, then maybe you climb a tree. As Zacchaeus climbs the tree, I want to focus on him this morning on this Palm Sunday, not just because it excites me and entertains me to do something rogue, (laughs) but because I think in Zacchaeus, we see expressed in a real, tangible, personal, individual level the cost of discipleship. And the cost of discipleship is heavy. It is weighty. Jesus warns us that we should count the cost before we take, enter into it lightly. But I also want to say to you today, on this eve of Holy Week, as Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem, as he's welcomed in with shouts and praises by his disciples, that the cost of discipleship is also joyful. That as real as the concerns are, as weighty as the challenges we might face and will face as disciples, the cost of discipleship is joyful. And it's joyful firstly because as we seek Jesus, as Zacchaeus does, we learn that Jesus first seeks us. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. He was short. Are you short today? Some of you are like, I'm short every day. But are you short today? Are you short on joy? Are you short on hope? Are you feeling short on peace? Is your tank of meaning and purpose running low today? Zacchaeus, this story at the start of Jesus' entrance to Jerusalem as the chapter unfolds, reminds me that Jesus comes to those who are short, who are in need, who lack and seek him. And he does that even in the shadow of the cross, even on the road to Jerusalem. Even as Jesus walks towards his own death, he stops. No, he doesn't even stop yet. He directs his path so that on the way to his great trial and suffering, he can make a side quest, schedule an extra encounter to meet Zacchaeus in the midst of his seeking. Jesus in Jericho looks up and sees Zacchaeus in a tree, isolated and alone, and Jesus sees you. There's no one up in the balcony today, but you're part of the crowd. You're here, maybe you're watching online. Maybe that's the tree you climbed so that you could see a glimpse of Jesus this morning from a hospital bed or from your couch at home. If you are seeking Jesus today, wherever you are seeking to see him from, know that he seeks you. And he continues to seek the short of us, those nearing the end of our rope, who have found that all the things we chase after never satisfy. Jesus seeks those who have piled up walls of wealth and privilege, of power and fame and prestige, only to find themselves isolated and alone in the midst of this city. Jesus seeks those who the crowds close against, who the religious find too messy or too wicked or too troublesome, too broken or unrepentant. I want to remind us today that Jesus seeks those who would find no welcome even as we draw near to see him ourselves. And not only that, not only can we find joy in the fact that Jesus seeks us, 
but we can take joy in the fact that Jesus welcomes us as we seek him. The cost of discipleship is joyful because as we seek Christ, he welcomes us. Luke tells us that when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up into that sycamore fig tree and he says, Zacchaeus, come down at once. I must stay at your house today. Jesus doesn't just see Zacchaeus, but he welcomes him into a relationship. Jesus doesn't look up into the tree and say, Zacchaeus, here are all the things that you need to change about yourself before we can have a conversation. Here are all the things that you need to set right before I will stop and spend some time with you. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. Jesus saw Zacchaeus as a man in desperate need of community, of love, of a sense that God saw him and cared enough to stop. And Jesus did so, even on the road to the cross. What was Jesus carrying with him that day? Right At most days, weeks out from his death. A group of slow to learn, quick to err disciples along with him. Crowds who wanted to see him do spectacular things, but ultimately would go home and continue on with their lives. An understanding that he would soon suffer and die for those same crowds. And yet, Jesus didn't just take time to see Zacchaeus, he stopped. Jesus is never too busy saving the world to stop and save one heart which seeks him above all else. And nor is he too embarrassed or righteous to stop and enter into the life of Zacchaeus, that wealthy, greedy, unrepentant tax collector. And he's never too embarrassed or righteous to stop for you. which adds to the cost of discipleship because the crowd sees this interaction, sees that Jesus is going to Zacchaeus' house, and they say, he is gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, who else could Jesus eat with but sinners? Be a lonely 33 years eating alone every night. And yet... Even as all we have gone astray and turned everyone to their own way, and the Lord has laid on Christ the iniquity of us all, we can read a verse like that and recognize that we are all sinners, that Christ would have no one to eat at his dinner party with if he didn't eat with sinners. And we can let that be a joyful song of wonder and worship. He eats with sinners. But how often do we let it become a curse aimed at Jesus' back? where he goes somewhere that we are not willing to follow. When he pays a cost in respectability, when he pays a cost in his witness that we're not ready to pay. It's at this point when Jesus says, I'm going to go eat with you, Zacchaeus, that the cost of discipleship becomes too high for the crowds. When those who are seeking to follow Jesus as disciples might choose to shrink and become just spectators. And it's hard for us in our day today to imagine the social scandal of Jesus' practice of eating with tax collectors and sex workers and those outside of God's covenant laws with Israel. It's hard because we hear about it so often. It was such a regular practice in his life. How rarely is it a practice in our lives? Do we take for granted that Christ goes where we're not willing to go. That he pays costs that we're not willing to pay. Do we let our concerns over hurting our witness override welcoming sinners to our table or going humbly to their tables? When we spend more time policing our platforms than we do for preparing meals, for those who need to know love in the presence of God, are we paying the cost of discipleship? If Jesus leaves us behind when he goes into the homes of unwed teenage mothers, or those gripped by addiction, 
when he eats with unrepentant, messy sinners of every kind, when he sits down at the table with queer activists or with those with hardcore military views, when he goes into places that we are uncomfortable for one reason or other of going, do we go with him? Do we pay the cost of discipleship? And as the crowd complains, Peter and the disciples find themselves faced with the choice of what do they do next? Do they pay the cost? Do they go where Jesus goes? Do we? Because that choice is a matter of life or death for Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who had never been invited, probably for years, to a dinner at in the city, unless it was with other tax collectors. And I can't imagine a less fun bunch than a bunch of tax collectors sharing a meal. This man who was so desperate for community, so desperate to be seen, so desperate to know if God still saw and cared about him, when he hears that invitation, that Christ is going to come to his house today, that Christ is not ashamed to be seen with him and in his presence, his response is unrestrained joy. Unrestrained joy is the response to God's grace that we see in the gospel when a disciple truly understands the cost of what Christ has done for them. The gospel creates joy in those who are ready to hear it. And I know this because it created joy in me and it has created joy in you. But maybe there are times in our lives that we need to be reminded of that joy in the face of another, still glowing with amazement that Christ would stop and eat with them. The joy of the good news of salvation in Jesus through grace ought to buoy us, to lift us, to steady us in the face of the cost of discipleship. For as we are stretched or challenged or even crucified with Christ, are we still able to nurture joy that Christ welcomed me, a sinner, to his table? And does that motivate us to go into the road, out from the city, as we watch Christ rise triumphant and victorious over death, to go and bring others to this joyful feast, to invite sinners to come and taste and see that the Lord is good even to those who do not deserve his love? We have joy in the cost of discipleship, both as we follow Christ and as we are welcomed by him because he welcomes us. And the cost of discipleship is joyful because as we seek Christ, he changes us. At the meal, Zacchaeus stands up and he says, look, Lord, look, here and now I'm giving half of my possessions to the poor, 50%. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, which is a passive way to describe your life as a tax collector, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Immediately, 50% of my wealth, of my life, I give to the poor, Jesus. And if I've cheated anyone out of anything, I'll pay back four times what has been taken. Zacchaeus woke up that day one person, and he went to bed another. He woke up in one bed that morning, and he likely went to bed in another. Well, maybe on the floor, if my accounting is right. The cost of discipleship is high. But the cost of discipleship is joyful because Christ changes us. Zacchaeus isn't saved because he climbed a sycamore tree or because he climbed down out of a tree. He's not saved because he hosted a meal or even because he paid back all this ill-gotten wealth. Zacchaeus is saved in Jesus' presence because Jesus invited him into a relationship with him one built on faith and grace and repentance, 
and one that brought Zacchaeus great joy to turn from the wrong he was doing and to trust in the one who had sought him out and welcomed him into relationship. And yet, despite the fact that salvation was free and available to him, he does do all these things. He climbs a tree. He climbs out of a tree. He hosts a meal and he pays back all of that ill-gotten wealth, more than he had taken. We're reminded in this story that Zacchaeus is not saved by the things he does, by his works. But at the cost of his discipleship, the cost of choosing to follow this Jesus who sought him and welcomed him, includes taking action, of responding to being changed by Jesus. Elsewhere in scripture, Paul describes this as the fruit of the spirit or the fruit of faith. We're saved by grace through faith, we're told, not by works so that nobody can boast. And yet, James also reminds us that faith without works, faith without fruit, is not alive. It's dead. So if works don't save us, but if Christ saves us and calls us to be his disciples, then he also changes us so that we begin to live in ways that produce much good fruit. As we think about this in the context of discipleship, what does it look like to be disciples of Christ? Well, Christ is clear in his call that it's to go where he goes always. That when Christ goes to the cross, we pick up our cross and we follow along. That when Christ goes to a scandalous table, we bring our utensils and we take a seat. And that when Christ goes deep into the recesses of our hearts, and says, for instance, you love money too much. Then we don't push him out, and we let him work. We give away the wealth that he draws our attention to. We pay back what we have stolen and kept. And not only do we do that, but we do it joyfully. We leap up from the table and we say, Lord, look at what I am going to do. I am so excited to give half of my wealth to the poor. I am so excited to pay back what I have taken four times over. We do it joyfully, like Zacchaeus, because we find that following Jesus as his disciple is worth more joy than anything else we could find or hold on to. To paraphrase that description of Jesus heading to the cross, we pay the cost of discipleship because of the joy that has been set before us. And as Jesus looks at this heart, which sought him, allowed him to welcome him in, and has responded to his power by being willing to change, Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house, for this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. What if this is what we talked about when we talked about discipleship? What if this was what we talked about when we talked about the good news of Jesus? That yes, it requires a sobering assessment of who we are and where we are, about our willingness to follow wherever Jesus leads. But that mathematical arithmetic, that calculation and accounting, that calculating of, am I willing to build the tower to follow him where he leads? Will I go where he goes and allow him to look where he wants to look in my heart and make the changes he wants to make? Zacchaeus shows us that for true disciples, that calculation is made with joy as you recognize just how worthy of being followed he is, of how worthy of paying whatever cost we could pay in return he is, that he actively seeks the lost, that he welcomes home freely those who have long been dismissed and written off, that he continues to work and change our hearts to be more in line with his, to desire him more than all else, that cost becomes easier to pay as we let Christ work in us. Now, I don't want to sugarcoat things. Discipleship is costly. We've reflected on that over this past month. But here, as Jesus' disciples soon line the road into Jerusalem and sing, Hosanna, welcome to the king glory and honor as the angels bow down in heaven 
Worthy is the lamb who was slain. As churches gather around the world globally today to celebrate the risen and victorious Christ, they all do it with joy. As Zacchaeus comes down from the tree, before he's even met Jesus for a hug or a handshake, before bread has been broken, he does so with joy because he recognizes that in Jesus, here is someone who he will never meet again an opportunity he will never experience again. The opportunity to be forgiven, restored, resurrected. As Jesus walks the road to the cross, these final days and hours before his crucifixion, as we journey with him through the palm branches and the coats to that upper room and share the meal together on Thursday night, as we watch him suffer and die for us in our place on Good Friday, as we wait in silent expectation on Saturday, and as we rise excited and hopeful to be wowed once again by the rise of the sun and light in the darkness, do we do so joyfully? And does that joy enable us to pay the cost of discipleship day in, day out, as Christ unfolds his work in you. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, fill us with joy. Remind us of our first love. Remind us, Lord, of the shock and the amazement, the wonder that you would stop for us. Stir it up in our hearts, Lord. Speak to us as we remember the price that was paid for us, what you endured on the cross, and come like a flood. Come flowing down, Lord, with joy, with peace, and with love. Fill this place because we want to follow you, Lord, and we want to do so with joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Will your love reign, reign, and my sin wash white? I owe all to you. I owe all to you, Jesus. feeling in my heart, and that feeling in your heart, perhaps, is called conviction. The powerful way that God's Holy Spirit works through the Bible applied to us, through a powerful message, through a word that we needed to hear, has become in our hearts, in many of our hearts, conviction about what we ought to do next. Yes, but first of all, about Jesus, who came to seek and to save the lost. What a marvelous Lord we serve. Praise Jesus that he came, that he walked that way to Jerusalem. That he set his face resolutely to go to the cross. And now we, in faith, in trusting him, owe it to Jesus to let this conviction not just wash away into the dust, not just to to vanish as we walk through the doors today, but to be really acted on. Perhaps you've made a decision in your heart today to make a change in your life. I pray that you'll do it, that you'll spend good time with God today, later today, and, and say, yes, God, That's what I'll do. Perhaps you've made a decision, an ultimate decision this morning, to trust yourselves for the first time to this Jesus. What a glorious thing. Make make sure you talk to another Christian about it. Talk to one of us. We'd be delighted to, to help you further on, go further on. But don't, Christian brothers and sisters, don't, children of the living God, Don't just let it wash away. Act on it today. And may God bless you in the week to come too. Amen.